Video games have always served the intent of taking a player and bringing them into a new world. One where they get to be involved, as a hero, a villain, an explorer, or simply a resident in a local city. The most important aspect of these games is that anyone can play. Anyone can be the plumber who saves the princess, a bounty hunter who explores a new planet, a warrior who fights against dragons. That could be you. That could be anyone. And this idea exploded. In an instant, video games became infused into the mainstream and was a central form of entertainment. Everyone wanted their hands on the new Nintendo console, or the new Sega console, or any console they could get their hands on so they could join in on the fun. Video games had, and still have, that universal appeal. At the same time, in our more inclusive world, representation has become far more relevant. Though representation has always been important, we have only recently recognized just how important it actually is. And we're still at this young age of trying to improve representation so that everyone's voice is heard. Then we have some great examples of representation recently. Miles Morales has great black representation. Celeste essentially became the game of all trans women. Life is Strange True Colors has distinctly queer voices. Representation is getting better. But as an industry, we still have further to go. Much further, in fact. Because games are supposed to be for everyone, it is imperative that games are designed with representation and accessibility in mind. And when games have any sort of romantic mechanic, that cannot be limited to straight relationships, as that only further marginalize the already marginalized LGBTQ community. In order then to be inclusive and accessible to non-straight individuals, games have opened up romance options. Video games have such a strong hold in the world of entertainment that having any sort of representation helps normalize inclusivity. If people see a gay character or a trans character in a game, that will help to cause to normalize those individuals within our society. And just as well, since many players are queer, it is unfair for games to gatekeep inclusive mechanics such as limited relationships to being exclusively straight. So in order to make video games accessible to all players, many design philosophies have become common. Some games will simply have some characters be gay and some characters be straight. Other games have implemented the far more common marry whoever you want philosophy. The problem with the marry whoever you want design philosophy is that bisexual people exist. Or do they? By using bisexuality as a game mechanic, games either make every character bisexual, which isn't realistic, or completely ignores canonical sexuality. In Stardew Valley, you start off a game by choosing your gender, which is limited to male and female, as every character in the game falls into this binary. But after you do this, your relationship with other characters change, opening new dialogue and new quests. However, regardless of whichever gender you choose, you can marry anyone you want. This means that when you play as a woman, every other woman becomes gay, while all the men become straight. And when you play as a man, every other man becomes gay, while every woman becomes straight. Either way, your character would technically be bisexual. The catch is, the marry whoever you want design philosophy is intended so that the character can reflect your sexual or romantic identity. So by erasing the canon of sexuality, the game most accurately represents bisexual players. The big question is, is this good or bad? Well, first we have to consider why it is this way to begin with. Video games serve as an escape from reality into a new world. Stardew Valley in particular fully embodies this intent. When you start the game, you are booted into this vibrant world with a massive farm and warm community where you can engage with locals and perform many activities. At its core, Stardew Valley is all about putting yourself in a peaceful world where you can do whatever you want at your own pace, in your own peace, and it is impossible to lose. It's a game about relaxing and living a pleasant life. So, gatekeeping romantic relationship options limits players in that fantasy life. Say Abigail was not bisexual, but rather canonically lesbian. If a straight man plays the game and wanted to romance her, he wouldn't be able to. Now, in a real-world setting, this would be accurate and appropriate. Straight men are not allowed to impede on lesbian women's life. 
and any attempt is both disgusting and unacceptable. But in the context of a game, he has been limited from achieving the fantasy life he wanted. One of the things that Stardew Valley does incredibly well for inclusivity is including the ability to change genders through the Wizard Tower. For transgender players, this option is a godsend, because this is not the type of game you want to restart. This is the type of game you pour hours upon hours into over the course of years. But let's say you play as a man and you marry Abigail. By potential sexuality canon, Abigail would now be straight. But if you transition through the Wizard Tower, Abigail suddenly becomes gay. I say this because this was my exact experience. But the same is true for every character. It's not an accurate representation of the real world, but anything else would limit players' freedom. Because Stardew Valley is a game that lets you do your own thing, it is not a game that limits your potential actions. You can freely do whatever you want to do. You can go wherever you want, talk to whoever you want to. So, if this design philosophy did not carry over to the characters and romance options, then the game would lack coherency. At the same time, what if there was a lesbian player who wanted to marry Haley? If each character had defined sexualities and Haley was straight, then that player would be rejected from that relationship. This might not be as big of a deal for straight players, but for a gay player who has already been marginalized, oppressed, and rejected from tradition in the real world, it can be damaging to that player to not be able to be accepted even in this digital fantasy world. Then consider that situation with the gender changing mechanic. In my situation, I married Abigail while my character was male, but during that marriage I changed my gender. Imagine if the characters were not bisexual and Abigail was canonically straight. When I change my genders, what would Abigail do? Would there be a mechanic where she leaves the relationship if she is straight and I am a woman? Would she stay in the relationship even though she was straight? I play Stardew Valley for a pleasant and relaxing time, not to deal with rejection and failed marriages. So I ask the same question once again. Is this good or bad? Well, for gameplay and inclusivity, it's good, but for representation, it's bad. Because queer identities are less common than straight identities, many people have not been able to hear queer voices, and as a result, are uninformed on queer issues. All the same, queer representation is beneficial for queer people, as they are able to see direct role models and feel comfortable with their identities. For queer people, seeing exclusively straight identities is extremely damaging. With entertainment being as massive as it is, having unique figures that all types of people can relate to is crucial. It can validate their identity and empower people to not let their identities hold them back. Rather, they may embrace their identity with pride and stand up for their beliefs. To say that good representation of all voices isn't important is not only incorrect, it's negligent. If queer representation in video games is limited to bisexuality, one, it's not good representation, and two, it means that non-bisexual queer people are not receiving any representation whatsoever. A gay person can play Stardew Valley and have a pleasant gay relationship, but it hardly shakes the fact that the same character would still have married you had you been playing as a woman. That character isn't gay, they're just functioning in the way to be most appealing and functional to all players. But this isn't necessarily a criticism of the game. Stardew Valley is my favorite game ever, and I love it dearly. Because the truth is, there is no perfect solution. If certain characters are made canonically gay in all situations, rather than bisexual, that massively constrains player choice and goes against the game design philosophy. On the other hand, not doing this limits representation, and despite making every character canonically bisexual, it seems to erase bisexual identities. I really wish I could make this video and come out with a perfect solution that solves this problem, but the truth is, I don't know. This is a bizarrely unique situation where there may not truly be a solution. The only sense of resolve I see is considering every game case by case. Despite making representation less effective, I think Stardew Valley's approach to bisexuality as a game mechanic is truly the best option. 
It allows the player to have complete freedom, and those who wish to have a gay, straight, or lesbian relationship may do so if they so desire. While it is true that the characters those players have relationships with are technically bisexual to serve the gameplay, most players will not experience the game as the opposite gender. And even then, bisexuality is not a bad thing. I would rather have every character be bisexual than every character be straight. But this sort of solution is imperfect, as it's not universal. Stardew Valley's approach to relationship freedom is tied directly into the game design philosophy. But that concept of bisexuality as a mechanic extends much further than just Stardew Valley. In Life is Strange, Max has some relationship freedom. Being a narrative-driven game, however, Life is Strange has a drastically different design philosophy. That is a whole story where you have control over your relationships with people. You can choose to be mean to people who have been mean to you, but that decision will affect the way people treat you through the rest of the game. The specific ways you treat people will affect the choices you have later in the game. A forewarning that I will be discussing some very light spoilers, so skip ahead if you feel so inclined, or stick around if you'd like. Throughout the game, if you treat Warren well, you may have the choice to kiss him later in the game. At the same time, regardless of your decisions, you have the option to kiss Chloe a bit earlier in the game. People laud Life is Strange for a dedicated bisexual main character, and it's true. Max is not just bisexual for a mechanic, she is bisexual because that's just who she is, and her bisexuality permeates throughout the way that she is written. Regardless, you ultimately have a choice. Do you kiss Chloe? Do you kiss Warren? Do you kiss neither? Or do you kiss both? Depending on how you play, you have all of these options. Now, of course, a kiss does not justify a relationship, and it certainly doesn't justify romantic or sexual attraction. However, it is reasonable in this case to infer some attraction, as if you decide to kiss both Chloe and Warren, you have a sort of nightmare sequence where both Warren and Chloe discuss how you are playing both of them, as if by kissing them, you are cheating on both of them. So, in the time the player gets to control Max in her life, you can decide who she begins a relationship with, and at the end of the game you essentially decide who she lives and who dies. It's not exactly a choice between Chloe and Warren, rather it's a choice between Arcadia Bay and Chloe. One dies while the other lives. If players choose to save Chloe, then Max and Chloe run off together and presumably start their own life together. If the player saves Arcadia Bay, then it's unclear who Max ends up with. But there's a certainly decent chance she ends up with Warren, as he is the only other character Max shows any sort of attraction to during the extent of the story. The point is, Max is bisexual, but there's not an ultimate romance option. Rather, there are romantic paths that the player can ultimately go through depending on the various decisions you make throughout the game. It's not about choosing who you end up with, because you don't get to choose. It's about how you behave over the course of the game. This sort of representation is more grounded and realistic, as it does not rely on a simple binary choice. But since relationship options are tied to your overarching behavior regarding choices that are not explicitly related to your relationships, you don't recognize that those choices have an effect on your relationship options later. So the use of bisexuality as a mechanic is far more effective because your romance choices are, in a sense, invisible. Your relationships are more natural, and that makes sense, as life is strange as a character-driven drama, whereas Stardew Valley is more of a fantasy life simulator. But in regards to good representation, like the representation in Life is Strange, it would be reasonable to consider what would happen if the main character wasn't bisexual? What if the character was simply gay? Well, that question is answered in Life is Strange Before the Storm. Don't Nod and Deck Nine have made it fairly clear that Chloe Price is a lesbian. Many considered her bisexual, as she has canonically had relationships with quote-unquote bad boys but she very clearly has some romantic attraction to women. That is both clear in the original Life is Strange and Before the Storm, but the most evident piece of evidence 
is this picture of Chloe with a lesbian pride flag officially posted by Square Enix during Pride Month. Life is Strange is using bisexuality as a mechanic in a much different way. It's not about choice, it's about behavior. A straight player may end up with Warden, not even realizing that Max is bisexual, and a gay player may end up with Chloe while also remaining oblivious. But that is a much bigger problem altogether, because when done wrong, this falls into the category of queerbaiting. Queerbaiting is the idea that media presents a character with allusions to being queer, who ultimately end up being straight as to not upset those who oppose the LGBTQ+. Media that does this does not progress anything, challenges their own messages, harms their own characters, and hurts the LGBTQ+. When characters present in a traditionally queer manner, making that character straight to appeal to a broader audience ultimately enables people to challenge queer identities. Mitigating queer baiting with bisexual characters comes down to writing. Is the character actually written to be clearly bisexual? In this case, is Max's attraction to Chloe evident despite the possibility she ends up with Warren? I think the answer to this question is a hesitant yes, maybe? While the evidence of bisexuality could be pushed further for clarity to all players, there are certainly allusions to bisexuality that are very intentional. I think the shortcomings and potential queerbaiting issues in Life is Strange are unintentional, mistakes that could be greatly improved on in subsequent installments. Which is indeed what happened. Life is Strange Before the Storm does not hide the fact that Chloe is queer. While it's not clear in the game if she's bisexual or lesbian, the notion that she is queer and attracted to Rachel Amber is unquestionable. I mean, you cannot watch the theater scene without realizing that they're extremely attracted to each other romantically. There is no denying the fact that they are attracted to each other. This makes the case of the original Life is Strange game much better as it is made clear the franchise is not shying away from their queer characters and messages. Life is Strange was not trying to hide bisexuality because the very next game validates and directly engages with the queer identities and forms the entire story around that queerness. So it's evident then that in a game where romance is relevant, the character's specific sexual and romantic orientations are to some degree, importance. The specifics of that have to be controlled for every unique case, like Stardew Valley, where every character is bisexual so the player can marry whoever they want, as the game is, by design, free. But what if we removed that freedom but maintained a similar character structure? How should romance be handled in that situation? Let's take a look at Fire Emblem Three Houses. And wouldn't you know, the main character is bisexual. But this bisexuality comes with a twist. You get to choose a male form or a female form, but unlike Stardew Valley, that actually does limit your choices. Before we consider the relationship design in Fire Emblem Three Houses, we must first consider the LGBTQ plus rights in Japan. Japan has had a rough history with the LGBTQ plus rights dating back to 1872 when homosexuality was expressly banned. In 1880, a whole eight years later, these bans were rolled back, yet homosexual marriage was still prohibited. To this day, homosexual marriage is still prohibited. In 2009, the Japanese government allowed citizens to have same-sex marriages in countries where same-sex marriage was legal, so a married gay couple could live in Japan after they got married, but they could not have the act of being married in Japan. Then in 2015, a partner system was put in place, which allowed for same-sex partners to be legally recognized as partners, serving a similar role to marriage without legally being married. In 2020, a case to legalize homosexuality was presented to court, and though nothing changed, it seems as if the ban on same-sex marriage will be lifted in the very near future in Japan. We can only hope. 
As of today, no discrimination laws have been put in place to protect LGBTQ plus citizens of Japan. I say this because Japan has not yet settled on the matter, and LGBTQ plus citizens face unequal rights and discrimination in Japan. So even though Fire Emblem Three Houses is more constraining on the player, the game is actually a significant step forward for LGBTQ plus rights in Japanese media. Unlike Stardew Valley, Fire Emblem Three Houses has some characters with better defined sexualities. Unfortunately, those defined sexualities are almost exclusively straight. But the game is still intentional to offer same-sex relationship options, however, you're not allowed to marry whoever you want. In any given game, based on the gender you choose, you can marry anyone of the opposite gender and a few of the same gender. So some characters are still bisexual, and the player character is bisexual as a mechanic. Again, considering Japan's lesser LGBTQ plus rights, it's unsurprising that their relationship options aren't as open to queerness. But it says something that despite the unequal rights, the game allows players to have some choice as to same-sex relationships. So is this a way to shortcut queerness? Is it done to please the Japanese government? Is it done to gatekeep gay men because why on earth is Claude straight? Well, fellow listeners. Let me become a detective and crack open this case. Fire Emblem Three Houses dedicates a lot of time to each character. There are so many branching paths and new dialogue that can be revealed. For instance, every house has a new story. Every character has multiple one-on-one -on -one conversations with every other character. Every character has tea time conversations. Every character has meal dialogue. Almost every character can change houses and have new dialogue based on that. Oh, and any character can permanently die at any given moment in gameplay. And new dialogue comes in to respond to this. Then, at the end of the game, based on your relationship with each character and their relationships with each other, you get even more new dialogue and a quick summary of each character's life after the game. With changes based on everything that happened in the game, plus every character, even the side characters having voice acting, no line goes without voice acting in the entire game. That's a lot of writing, and a lot of dialogue. My theory is that they wanted every character to be bisexual, but they simply ran out of time to write more dialogue options based on those relationships. I would very much not be surprised if they simply ran out of time to add in all the dialogue they wanted, and decided they would leave it be as is. But maybe not? We don't have any clear answer, so I have to ask, why is this limit in place? As I mentioned with Stardew Valley, if the game has a valid reason to make some characters gay, some characters bisexual, and some characters straight, then that's fine. Not every game has the same open design philosophy that Stardew Valley has, and that's good. But if you're going to go out of your way to make some characters exclusively straight, why not also make some characters exclusively gay? It's not only more conclusive, it's not only better representation, it's definitively more accurate to the way the world works. Ultimately, all these examples ask one question. Is it okay to use bisexuality as a mechanic in order to better function in coherence with the mechanics of the game? Sexuality isn't a tool, but giving players a choice fits game design philosophy while being inclusive to more players. The debate comes down to the visibility of the choices. While characters are functionally bisexual, one could argue that canon is what the player decides to do with the character. I would rather have a character of unspecified sexuality but who is functionally bisexual than have a button at the beginning of the game declaring yourself gay, straight, or bisexual. If the character has romance choices of differing genders, functional bisexuality might be the best way to be inclusive to LGBTQ players. It's imperfect, but it works. But if a game does not have romance options, but has a focus on character writing, then more defined sexualities should follow. The game doesn't even need to focus on relationships. Simply put, sexual and romantic attractions impact how a character behaves, 
even to outside of relationships. So don't shy away from representation. So where do we go from here? Well, the world is changing, and games have a long way to go in regards to representation. There is always going to be resistance to inclusivity and diversity in the design space. But media can stand up to this with uplifting stories and positive messages to enforce validity in these identities. Even though the world often fails to be inclusive, video games can change that. Games can fight against that with stories and mechanics that uplift queer voices. Especially in the indie scene, representation is blossoming in new and unique ways. Creatives are expressing their voices, and through that we're getting passionate and progressive stories that can create a positive impact in the world. Games like Celeste embrace queer identities, Stardew Valley gives you freedom in relationships, Delta Rune features a non-binary protagonist, and Night in the Woods doesn't shy away from visible character sexualities. Video games are an incredible medium for representation. They can push society forward to being more inclusive and considerate, more understanding and more accepting. We, as developers, just have to take advantage of the opportunity to make the biggest and most meaningful impact we can in the world. Thank you.